Well, everything changed uh, over the past few hours when Vladimir Putin said yesterday that they are at war now with NATO. This represents a massive shift in the Russia-Ukrainian war. Uh, there are a lot of moving pieces, and for that, we wanted to bring in uh, expert analysis, former UN weapons inspector, former Marine, uh, Scott Ritter, friend of the show. Uh, we welcome you back. Scott, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. So a lot of moving pieces. I want to get your perspective specifically on the military strategy piece of this first, the shift. You posted yesterday that this was a fundamental shift for Russia now at war with NATO. I mean, they're not pulling any punches. I think you and I have talked over the past few months that that was kind of always the case. Like that's really what's been happening. But now to hear him say that outwardly uh, was kind of an, am an amazing moment. Um, what does this mean exactly for NATO countries? First, I want to start there. Like, what is the United States now going to do? Or, uh, you know, what will Germany do now that we, we call a spade a spade? Well, I think we need to get down to, you know, first principles here. Um, the United States, NATO, and Europe have had a concerted policy direction since the end of the Cold War that uh, when it comes to Russia, uh, calls for the perpetual weakening of Russia, up to and including the dissolution of Russia, the Russian Federation as it currently exists. Um, you know, the decade of the 1990s was all about the castration of Russia. Let's just call it what it was. It was the economic and political castration of Russia. Um, the, the national security uh, establishment uh, here in the United States, there's you know, there's papers that back this up, and I'm sure if I dug deep enough into NATO and Europe, I'd find the same, that said, we must make sure that Russia never again rises to the level of the Soviet Union, that though it is the West's interest to keep Russia down in perpetuity. That was the policy. The West has never been Russia's friend, never tried to be Russia's friend. It was all about economic exploitation and political castration. This is the reality that existed when Vladimir Putin came into power uh, in, in late 1999. Uh, and it's a policy that's been in play ever since then. So this notion that, you know, this, you know, NATO expansion is something new. No, NATO expansion has always been there. And we see James Baker, when he came back from his discussion with uh, Gorbachev and Shevardnadze, and he reported to the Bush National Security Council that, hey, uh, I sort of committed to, uh, we're not going to expand NATO. He was shouted down and said, nope. We are expanding NATO because our policy is to permanently constrain Russia, and we need an expanded NATO to do that. Um, and so, you know, just from the Russian perspective, this this war, this conflict in Ukraine, you know, it, it's not how the West has portrayed it as Russian aggression. This is Russia saying our back has been put up against the wall. We know what you want. We know what you're trying to do. We've spent a whole bunch of time trying to talk you out of this including promulgating two draft treaties in December 17th of last year that said, hey, why don't we just sit back and look at a new European security framework that tones everything down, backs you up, keeps us neutral, you know, a, new, a band of neutrality. We don't need to worry about direct conflict. NATO and the United States wouldn't even consider it. Instead, they were going forward with a policy that had been in place since 2014 to use Ukraine and Ukraine's uh, accession into NATO as a vehicle to gut Russia. Again, going back to the original policy to permanently cripple Russia to lead to the political, um, you know, neutering of, of Russia uh, beyond simply removing Putin from power, ensuring that whoever replaced Putin could never be a strong leader because Russia would never be a strong nation. This is the reality. So when NATO started supplying weapons to Ukraine, Russia knew what the game was. They knew straight up what it was. It didn't take long for NATO to admit it. When we have Lloyd Austin traveling to Kiev and saying, look, the golden objective here is to bleed Russia dry. We're going to kill as many Russians. He didn't say it the way I'm saying, but he, he, I'm paraphrasing right. him. But he said the goal is to weaken Russia to the point that Russia can never again uh, carry out this kind of activity. And I've said this all along, that when you infuse tens of billions of dollars of military assistance into a nation like Ukraine, you, you fundamentally change the game. This is a game-changing event because what you're saying isn't that I'm simply trying to empower Ukraine to defend itself against Russian aggression. 
No, the NATO game is to empower Ukraine to be able to carry out offensive action to expel Russia from the Donbass, to expel Russia from Kherson, to recapture Crimea. And this is important because right now, NATO can politically get away with it because legally speaking, uh, in the eyes of much of the world, Kherson is Ukraine. Right. <laughs> Even Russia will say right. it's, it's Ukraine right now. Uh, Zaporizhia, Ukraine, Donbass, Russia says they're independent, but they're not yet Russia. What Vladimir Putin did is set in motion the events that will make every piece of territory where a Russian soldier currently stands, Mother Russia, in the eyes of Russia, which means any action undertaken by Ukraine or NATO against this territory, targeting this territory, becomes an act of war against Russia. What Putin has done is put it right in the face of NATO and say, do you want war? Here's your chance. I'm here. Russia's here, we're here. Bring it on. Because if you do, it's all over for you. Putin, it wasn't bluff when he said, we have the means to defend ourselves. We have better weapons than you. Everybody knows what he's talking about. Nuclear weapons. We are literally, you know, they have that doomsday clock. Yeah. You got to move it to one second before midnight. We're this close to the world ending. That close. Right like that. Jeez. If NATO doesn't back the hell off, if NATO continues to pretend that this is some game designed to weaken Russia, Russia just fundamentally changed the rule. They said, we're not playing that game anymore. Remember I talked about game changing event? The game has changed. And NATO needs to wake up to the fact that anything it does once the referendum is passed is an act of war against Russia. And Russia will treat it as such and respond accordingly. It will not be a slow roll out. If NATO continues to provide Ukraine with the means to attack Mother Russia, which very soon will be Kherson, Zaporizhia, you know, all that daily pounding of the nuclear plant, it's over, man. It's over. Do it again when it becomes Russia. I dare you, Ukraine. You will cease to exist. I'm not saying Russia is going to use nukes against them. Russia will just simply turn out the lights. Russia will kill the leadership. The gloves are off. That what this has been a special military operation, and we've discussed that in the past about how it constrains Russia. All constraints are off. When Russia is talking about defending Mother Russia, they are now going to bring all of its abilities to the forefront to accomplish this task. Something I talked to a Russian about yesterday. I talked about partial mobilization, and he said, "Remember, it's partial mobilization. Right. It's only three hundred thousand. <laughs> we got twenty-five million. We can go as big as you want to go." And Russia is ready to go as big as necessary. And if NATO wants to make this an issue, then Russia will cross that threshold, meaning that if NATO wants to threaten the, the, the existence of Russia by attacking Mother Russia, either directly or through the Ukrainian proxy, then Russia will use every means at its disposal to ensure that that will fail, up to including nuclear weapons. Sergei Lavrov said there's two conditions under which nuclear weapons can be used under Russian doctrine. Condition one, you attack us with nukes, we will respond. Condition two, you threaten the national survival of the Russian nation, and we will use nuclear weapons. NATO right now is posturing itself to threaten the national survival of the Russian nation. So what do you think the NATO does? What do you, I mean, now that we have this movement, we'll get to the referendum votes in a minute, but what does NATO do? Does NATO blink on this? Do they? They have no choice. They have to. They have no choice. Um, Stoltenberg, first of all, I mean, they won't do it, but Stoltenberg needs to be muzzled. He's out of control. He's out there saying things. Let's just remember who Stoltenberg is. And I'm not talking about the Norwegian aspect of it. He's the secretary general of a military alliance. He has no power, literally no power whatsoever. There's various committees within NATO that have all the power. For instance, on the military side, it's the military committee. It has all the power. It makes all the decisions. Stoltenberg is purely an administrator. So the wise thing to do would be for Joe Biden to call up Stoltenberg and say, you will never speak again, ever. And if you do, I'll terminate you. I can do that. I'm the president of the United States. I will go to NATO and say, fire him. Um, Stoltenberg needs to shut up for the, for, the, for the sake of the world because he's saying things that, he, A, he, it has, he's not empowered to act on any of this. Other people have to make these decisions, not him. And the military committee of NATO, 
very interestingly, came out and said, we're not at war with Russia. We're not at war with Russia. We're providing weapons to for Ukraine to defend itself, but we are not at war with Russia. So the difference in the tone between the people who really make a decision and this idiot named Stoltenberg is night and day. The people who really make the decision understand what's about to happen, and they are quickly backing off. It doesn't mean that NATO will stop supplying Ukraine with weaponry, but it does mean that NATO is going to stop um, speaking in terms of weakening Russia, of enabling Ukraine to retake the Donbass, retake Crimea. It now is strictly NATO is going to enable Ukraine to preserve what's left of its national integrity. This weekend, well, starting tomorrow, we have the referenda votes um, in these in the in the Donbass. Um, and so we do know that they're going to have these referendums over the few days. By the way, I've, I've said this on the show. I still can't understand how the United States holds elections on Tuesdays. Uh, but <laughs> everywhere else in the world, they managed to do it on a weekend so people can actually go out and vote. I saw the printing of the ballots, <laughs> printing of the ballots early this morning. Uh, they are ready to go on this. Um, we still don't have, at least from my my sources, we still don't have an understanding of what the security will look like and where they will go to vote. And I have to be honest. I mean, we saw, I'm concerned about this, right? We saw more shelling this morning, really horrific shelling in Donetsk this morning. The images are awful. Uh, I spoke to a journalist this morning who said the attacks were on a civilian area once again. Um, we saw attacks overnight in Zaporizhia at the near uh, the nuclear power plant. We also saw a drone attack this morning in Crimea. So the attacks continue largely in civilian areas. What are they going to do to provide security for the voting to take place on this referenda? What do you think? What are you hearing on this? Well, let's let's again back off for a second. The Russians, you know, one of the things that people have noticed about this special military operation is the relatively low key role played by the Russian Air Force, mm. uh, that it's not out in the numbers that wanted I mean, during the Gulf War, I have to tell you, man, the sky was black with F-16s, the sky was black with A-10s, the sky was black with F-15s. Um, you know, it, it, we own the air and we proved we own it by just blanketing the area and targeting things massively every day. Um, you know, the Russians are sending out sorties, you know, uh, uh, two SU-25s here, two SU-25s there, a handful of um, you know, uh, SU-35s uh, uh, up in the air to provide, uh, you know, air defense. But the sky isn't black with Russian aircraft. Mm -hmm. But what we found out is nearly 900 Russian aircraft have been accumulated in the periphery of the special military operations zone. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And now the Russians have also come out and basically said that um, if Ukraine undertakes any action to disrupt the referendum, that Russia will destroy infrastructure and national decision-making centers. So basically, Ukraine, if you want to commit national suicide, disrupt the uh, disrupt it. And I believe we will see, in that case, the sky of Ukraine become black with Russian aircraft as they hmm. basically hmm. unleash hell. So 300,000 called up reservists. Uh, give us a sense of what that means uh, strategically. We had, what, 200,000 currently involved on the Russian side. Right. Add to that a three hundred thousand level call up of reservists. Uh, can you cut through some of the propaganda on that right now? Uh, we've been hearing that you know they're grabbing young people in the streets and they're telling them that you're going to be joining this, and uh, that I've seen a lot of that largely debunked. But what will those three hundred thousand troops do, and where will they be positioned? What's your sense of the strategy and military equipment going forward? Well, let's let's talk about the the two hundred thousand plus that are currently there. When I say plus, you remember there's militias from the Donetsk People's Republic, Lugansk People's Republic. There are, um, in addition to the Russian forces, there's National Guard units. The Chechens are from the National Guard, the former Ministry of uh, Interior forces. Uh, there's volunteer units. Uh, so there's there's a whole uh, there's Wagner, the, the what they call a PMC, even though it's not a PMC. Um, there's there's a large force of people that comprises around 80,000 or so that are beyond the 200,000 Russians that are there. Uh, but let's just talk about the Russians that are there. These are frontline combat troops. These are troops that are configured to wage offensive and defensive conflict in accordance with Russian doctrine. Um, 
when they went in, I mean, I, I think everybody said it's, you know, it appears they're insufficient to the task because one of the things that has to happen when you take territory is you have to hold it. So even though we speak of 200,000 Russians, the Russians aren't able to mass 200,000 people at a point of interest and doctrinally launch an attack. They, they've they had to keep people back in rear area security, protect lines of communication, protect uh, power plants, protect uh, political zones, population centers, et cetera. Um, and this strips away about two thirds of Russia's combat capability. So even though they have 200,000 people deployed, they actually only have about 60,000 that can uh, engage in frontline combat on a 1,000 kilometer front. So that's uh, 60 guys mm -hmm. per kilometer. That ain't much. Uh, and, and so what the 300,000 is going to do is the, the Russians have been clear. These are not frontline troops. They, they, they said straight up, you're not going to the front. So any notion that some dude that's been out of the military for five years, put on a little bit of a belly, maybe got some arthritis in the shoulder, um, I remember what the rifle range looked like, but uh, hasn't fired around since then, uh, that they're going to take him, put a uniform on him, and throw him right into the meat grinder? No. What's going to happen is they're going to fall in on pre-existing reserve units. So literally, once these reserves show up, overnight, Russia's combat capacity will nearly quadruple on the front line, quadruple. And that is a massive game changer. This will now enable Russia to do doctrinal offensive operations. That means that when the First Guard's tank army comes online, it's not going to be piecemeal. It's going to be the whole damn First Guard's tank army, and they are going to do what doctrine tells them to do, which is to blast a hole into Ukrainian lines, penetrate into their rear, spread out, and annihilate everything. And they'll be supported by the 20th Combined Arms Army, the 6th Combined Arms Army, the 56th Combined Arms Army. You're going to have four Combined Arms Army online, and there ain't nothing that can stop them. To be frank, if they wanted to go to Berlin, they could go to Berlin because NATO's got nothing to stop them short of nuclear weapons. Now, fortunately for NATO, they don't want to go to Berlin. But they will go as far as necessary to achieve the objectives of the special military operation, even though they may rename it. Namely, that's demilitarization. The entire Ukrainian army has to go. Whether they want to die fighting or they want to surrender, it's up to them. But they're gone. They're finished. It will no longer exist. This means that the Zelensky government's out, a new government's in. Maybe the gentleman that the Ukrainians just released, uh, the, 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 the pro-Russian Ukrainian politician that was just exchanged as part of a prisoner exchange. Maybe he'll become the new president of Ukraine. Who knows? But they're gone. And all the political infrastructure associated with the right sector, with Sloboda, with these neo-Nazi uh, political movements, the, the worshipers of Stepan Bandera, they are going to be eradicated, eliminated, terminated. And Russia now has the military force to accomplish that. Um, look, when this, this war first started, I said I thought it would be over soon because I thought Russia was going to go in doctrinally. And I'll tell you right now, Ukraine could never have stood up to a Russian doctrinal offensive. NATO can't stand up to a Russian doctrinal offensive. Uh, but that didn't happen. The special military operation went in with a completely different mode of, of operating. And this thing is extended six months. Russia is now about to put doctrine on the table, slam that book down there and say, this is how we're going to fight this war. Game changer. Game changer. And over the next few days, we will see these referenda votes and we will see how this whole region changes over the next week. It's going to be a whole different world uh, when people wake up on Monday morning, I bet. Um, Scott, I said, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I just love having your analysis here on the show um, and providing your, your expert analysis of what's going on there. So I really appreciate it. Um, we'll stay in touch because I'd, I'd love to have you back soon. We'll see how this unfolds over the weekend. We'll see what NATO does. There's a lot of questions uh, floating out there and we'll see how the Zelensky government responds being pushed by NATO. Um, as always, Scott Ritter, thank you so much for joining us here on the show. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me.